Thank you so much. I will do my best to be as animated as possible, recognizing that we're in the middle of the late afternoon and you've had a full day of presentations. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak on this topic. I think it's a really uh, important and timely one. And uh, part of the reason why I made the transition into uh, private practice in the last uh, year or so is because uh, I was getting so many inquiries from autistic teens and adults and their families about mental health supports and the, and the lack thereof in the community in terms of how people are navigating the system and trying to find uh, the right supports for their loved ones and for themselves. Um, and so I'm hoping today to just give you a brief introduction to some of the uh, issues in this field and, uh, and also some of the solutions um, that I've discovered uh, on this journey. It's not moving forward. Oh, there we are. Okay. Okay, so uh, learning objectives. I uh, really want to talk a little bit about mental health vulnerabilities uh, and some protective factors in uh, this in this population to define mental health and then to integrate that definition with uh, the lives of autistic individuals, both in terms of my own lived experience and what people have shared with me, and also how do we look at broadening um, the valuing of autistic individuals in our uh, society at large. So this is a survey that was done uh, a little bit uh, some time ago. So we're looking, um, I think it was 2015, it's hidden away in the script, um, but about 15,000 uh, neurotypicals compared to uh, about 1,500 adults uh, on the spectrum. And they looked at uh, various physical health conditions and mental health conditions. And uh, so this is self-reported data, but it, it it portrays, you know, a lot of need. So if you look on the side, on starting on the left-hand side there, um, you know, GI issues, so gastrointestinal uh, gut issues, 24% uh, higher, uh, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, uh, anywhere from 42 to 69% higher. Um, so these are, uh, you know, um, uh, physiological challenges, health challenges that people are experiencing. Sleep disorders, 90% uh, higher. And we know sleep is heavily um, associated with all kinds of uh, mental health and coping abilities. If you don't sleep well, it doesn't matter who you are, um, you're going to have trouble uh, navigating life um, because sleep is a restorative activity for all of us. Anxiety, 117% higher. Depression, 123% higher. And then most concerning is uh, suicide attempts, 433% higher. Um, so clearly something is not going well for a lot of these uh, individuals. And, um, and we need to uh, figure out how to respond and support these people. So this is a complicated slide. We could spend a lot of time on it. Um, but uh, in psychology, we're often trained in what's called a biopsychosocial model of care. And so it's really looking at um, any mental health condition um, through all of these different lenses to try and make sense of what are the contributors and then also what are the assets and potential pathways for moving forward. Um, this came out of the pain literature initially where they discovered that when you looked at people who experienced uh, physical injury, they had very different responses to pain. So you could have two different people that get into a, a motor vehicle accident. One person kind of walks away and they're quite resilient, doesn't seem to impact their life. For another person, they have perpetual panic attacks, they can't get back into that car, and they have a lot more um, challenges in terms of uh, getting back into their regular life. So, the, so any, uh, any sort of mental health condition that we experience, we have um, a whole background of learning and um, our own bodies that, and a social environment that we're bringing into that circumstance. And we've talked about some of that with autistic burnout already. But if we start with just the psychological side of things, Right, The way we see ourselves, our self-esteem, our attitudes, our beliefs about ourselves, our perceptions, our temperament, our social skills that we're bringing to this situation, the coping skills that we've already learned, they will inform how we respond uh, to a particular uh, social demand. Underneath of that, we have, um, we're physical creatures, um, we're biological creatures, and we have uh, certain genetic heritages, um, certain biological vulnerabilities, if we're not feeling physically healthy, 
Um, we're going to have more trouble coping with uh, mental health uh, challenges. Um, we have uh, um, experiences with drugs, diet, and lifestyle. And all of this kind of informs our response. Socially, um, the kind of resources we have and the kind of demands we're experiencing when we navigate um, our environment um, really play a role in terms of how uh, mental health expresses itself. We have supportive families versus critical families. We have supportive work environments versus critical environments. If we have supportive school and learning environments versus critical environments, all of these are going to inform kind of our, our experience of mental health and our response in those um, situations. So when I work with, uh, with folks, um, we'll often sort of start with this kind of an activity, kind of figuring out their own experience and then doing a bit of mapping to see kind of what's contributing to what they're experiencing right now. And what are the resources they have that they may be overlooking in this situation that we could amplify? Switching tracks a little bit. So uh, definitions of mental health. Uh, World Health Organization, they've got a, a, a wonderful website with all kinds of resources on there. Um, what I like about uh, the way they characterize mental health, um, and I just pulled a few phrases out of, out of their website, is it's a little less pathological, right? So it's more than the absence of mental disorders. It's not just about getting rid of depression or getting rid of anxiety or getting rid of burnout. It's about something more, right? And so mental health is an integral part of health and there is no health without mental health. So physical health and mental health are connected. Um, in fact, the two sides of the same coin. Here you see uh, the World Health Organization referencing the same biopsychosocial model in a slightly different way, uh, determined by a range of socioeconomic, biological, environmental factors. And one thing they really wanna emphasize is it's not like we don't know how to respond to a lot of this. We've got a lot of literature on mental health um, and there's lots of cost-effective, efficient public health and intersectoral strategies and interventions that we can harness and bring to this uh, particular situation. So their definition, mental health is a state of mental well-being that enables people to cope with the stresses of life, realize their abilities, learn well and work well and contribute to their community. I really like that definition um, because I think it's quite holistic. Um, a state of mental well-being that enables people to cope with the stresses of life, realize their abilities, learn well and work well, and then contribute to their community. And so we're gonna break that apart a little bit. Okay, state of mental well-being. I'm gonna do a little exercise with you. Everybody just close your eyes for five seconds, okay? And I want you to visualize and think about for you, what is the state of mental well-being for you? Just try to capture that for a sec. Okay, now you can open your eyes again. When I do it, I often natural settings come to my mind, which is part of why put this picture in here. Um, and it's a feeling for me of wellness, a sense of peace, calmness. Um, often I feel connected, connected either with my natural environment or with the people around me. Um, I have a sense of value. I have a sense of purpose. I'm calm. I'm centered inside somehow. Um, so that state of mental well-being, I think, is an important pivotal piece um, to uh, uh, mental health. We have to find that somewhere. When I was listening to the presentation on autistic burnout, um, both presentations, um, you know, this really, uh, this, this, this came to my mind because, um, you know, this phrase around enabling people to cope with the stresses of life, right? What is that? What is, what do we mean by that? So in, in, uh, psychological literature, we've got a lot of models around stress, uh, threat appraisal and coping strategies. Uh, Lazarus and Folkman, they've got a model that goes way back into the early eighties. Um, thinking about how stress is really the perception that demands exceed resources. And it is a perception, perception that demands exceed resources, the resources that I have. And so it's really thinking about what resources am I overlooking? I think I'm losing my mic. And, um, and uh, what are there other ways of looking at these stressors or ways of managing or changing these stressors? 
so that they're less of a, a demand on myself. Um, and so the, the uh, Lazarus and Folksman's basic model is about, you know, how are we appraising those uh, stressors? Um, we have a primary appraisal process and then a secondary appraisal process. What can I do about the stressor? And then what coping strategies do I bring to this situation? And then what, how is my body sort of reacting to these stressors in the circumstance? And how do I, how do I bring that back around so I ground myself and feel more confident moving forward? Realizing their abilities. Um, here, and I think this is a, a, a criticism that um, we all bear some responsibility for in our healthcare systems, education systems, government, so forth. You know, when we go through school, when we have friends, when we participate in activities of life, we um, learn our abilities. We, we, we help, we, we learn to figure out what we're good at and what we're not so good at. And, um, and that's that comes out of our experiences so academic our relationships our work history our family our community values our perception of success or failure in the activity in those activities and that leads to something called self self-esteem and self-efficacy self-efficacy is this belief that i can do something when i need to do it when the demands are on me and we know from uh, many other uh, presentations in literature that our neurotypical society has not always valued autistic contributions in the way that we should. Um, and that sometimes those uh, judgments have been internalized in a, in a negative manner, right? And so we're getting better at it, but we still have a long, a long ways to go. I think in terms of modifying our environments, valuing different learning styles, valuing different contributing styles um, to make sure that um, people feel valued and feel successful uh, in the activities they participate in. So context and history uh, is really important in realizing your abilities. Learning well and work well um, is closely linked, right? Um, we know that there's lots of literature that uh, um, autistic uh, folks are under underemployed um, to the extent of you know somewhere around 80%, um, which is a pretty stark figure. Um, that uh, up to 80% of adults on the spectrum are not uh, being provided the opportunity to live up to their, to their uh, realized abilities um, through meaningful participation in work. And so that's a challenge, right? Something's, something's breaking down and literature is emerging about that in terms of what's breaking down. Um, but certainly there's uh, room for improvement there. Um, if I go way back, about 20 years ago, I used to work in the career field a little bit. And this, this importance of uh, recognizing a person environment fit, you know, my skills and abilities and the match between that and what the environment requires and demands of me, when those two mesh and fit together well, then we have success on both sides. Employment success, personal success. When there's a misfit, right, then things don't, don't work out so well. And... Um, and, and we need to become better at figuring out how to match those uh, contributions or characteristics. And then, of course, contributing to their community. So that, to me, is a contingent on a sense of belonging. You know, you have to feel like you're part of a community. You have to feel like you belong. You need to have space and place to be who you are. You need to feel like you can be authentic. You need to be accepted and celebrated for who you are. Um, and... Uh, and we have to become better, I think, at creating communities that are uh, more inclusive and welcoming of uh, all peoples. Um, so um, just want to, again, switch tracks a little bit, recognizing uh, we're getting close to the end here. Um, so people often ask me, you know, when, when do you need to seek out professional mental health and when are sort of personal supports uh, reasonable? So I just made up a list. Um, this is my list out of my head. Um, so thinking about when is something happening and the more of these that are happening, is it wise to start looking um, for some level of, of support, right? So sudden changes in mood that seem excessive and long lasting. So you were happy generally, and now you're not. And it's not a, a couple of days that this is happening. This is starting to happen for weeks or maybe months, right? Okay, maybe something's going on. 
In depression, our technical definition is more than two weeks, but sadness, anger, flatness, irritability, you know, major changes in mood that are lasting at, lo at least two weeks, paired with loss of interest in previously enjoyable activities, changes in energy levels or excessive fatigue, troubles with difficulties with uh, concentration and intention. If you see personality changes, either in your loved ones or yourself, where you used to be kind of a happy-go-lucky person and now you're not, you know, what's going on there? Um, are there panic attacks? Are you starting to experience panic attacks? Um, that's often an indication. Are there unusual changes in your sleep or dietary patterns that are at least a week in, in length? You know, can't eat anymore because my stomach's always tied in knots. I'm not sleeping. I'm always up at four in the morning, right? What's going on there? Something's happening. Uh, I often see people that come to see me in private practice when they go through major life adjustments. So the coping mechanisms they had were perfectly fine, working well, and then all of a sudden they lost their job, or they're going through a divorce, or they have a new baby, or they graduated from university, um, you know, and all of a sudden those coping mechanisms are not working quite as well anymore. They need to make some adjustments. If you're having excessive ruminations or difficulty controlling your thoughts, if there's more social withdrawal from people that you used to enjoy being with, in particular, if you're having a suicidal ideation, rumination, or excessive thoughts of violence or death, then it's important to talk to somebody and figure out what that's about. So what to do? Well, I would say start with your family doctor. Um, now we know there's a shortage of family doctors. And that's not always so easy. But uh, many mental health conditions, um, there's a physiological contribution that you need to look at to make sure that that's not the real issue. Um, you know, is it, are you experiencing uh, low energy, lethargy, uh, troubles concentrating, and so forth because you're um, diabetic? <laughs> you know, is it your blood sugar levels that are off? Or is there something else going on in your body? Uh, metabolic changes, for example, that could be occurring. Um, so always important to talk to your family doctor um, and, and get your blood test and your blood work and stuff done to make sure that there's nothing else going on in your body that might be contributing to why you're feeling the way you're feeling. If it is, in fact, something that um, is a mental health condition, then you have to reach out uh, much more broadly. If, if you're uh, autistic, um, I always recommend talking to service providers advocacy organizations like the Autism Society of Edmonton and area um, and other uh, healthcare professionals that might be able to steer you um, to different people that can support you for your needs. Mental health is a bit of a challenge um, because it's both privately and publicly funded and it's a bit of there's a lot of fragmentation um, in terms of finding the right person and the right supports um, for people. Two portals that I uh, quite like, one is the Psychologist Association of Alberta. Um, psychologists can pay to have their names listed on their referral service and uh, the referral service is it's free to the general public. You can search it by um, general condition or concern um, and, uh, and geography and it'll spit out a list of people that might be accepting uh, patients in your community. And then there's a more broad one, the Canadian Health Register of Psychologists that also has a referral portal. And um, that one's, uh, every psychologist that's on that registry is automatically listed. Um, they don't have to pay for that, that resource. And, um, and it's national, so it's across, it's across the country. And there are others, if you poke around. I know Psychology Today has a lot of uh, online referral networks and, and so forth. So just before finishing up, um, I wanted to create an opportunity to ask some, uh, uh, answer some questions, have some dialogue. And I thought I would just throw up that uh, definition for your own reference um, as we have that uh, opportunity. So thank you so much.